Okay, um, we're here to present um, Consensus R&D Project Rapid Fire. I'm Joseph Chow, and my teammates are here. Um, we'll, you'll get to meet them, um, some of them. So for Ethereum to be a foundation of Web3 and a next evolution of the internet, Ethereum must continually make progress towards four key areas, scalability, security, privacy, and usability. At a high level, scalability in Ethereum means more users and more using more and more decentralized applications without instability or degradation. Security is critical for the internet of value and the world economy is running on it. Privacy needs to be as good as web too, but it can be even better with self-sovereign identity and users controlling their data. Users can own their data and provide um, um, make um, services have access to it rather than the other way around. Usability needs to be as easy as Web2, but could it be even easier without passwords? Br briefly, some, some of the grand technical challenges. In scalability, can Ethereum remain as decentralized and as secure without every node having to verify every transaction? In security, can smart contracts be efficiently written and proven like mathematics? Mathematics, as we know currently, is bug-free. For example, if you add two positive numbers together, you'll know that you know, the result will be a positive number. In privacy, can Ethereum transactions remain private to only two parties, or maybe even one? If Alice makes a payment to Bob, maybe uh, only Alice and Bob should know about that transaction. And um, as an extension to that, maybe all Bob needs to know is that he just got paid, so he doesn't even know who he gets paid from. Before um, the rapid fire of the project, I'd like to point out that uh, aligning and focusing collaboration on existing efforts is currently as important than another strand of research. For example, in, in the Apollo program, if every team was designing and building their own spacecraft, you know, that the mission would not have succeeded to, to reach the moon. So similarly, in, instead of um, always uh, creating new strands of research, sometimes it's really important for us to try to align and focus more collaboration in existing efforts. And that's something that we try to keep in mind um, in consensus. So, We'll, we're going to have a rapid fire of two projects on scalability and one on security. And first up is um, Project Quilt. It's building prototype implementations for sharded execution models in Ethereum 2.0. And here's uh, Will Villanueva to present next. Uh, hey, what's up, all? Cool. Let me go ahead and switch the slide. Uh, cool. So this is a pretty brief presentation. Um, I'll just kind of go into an overview of some of the work. So uh, Matt Garnett and I, we were originally working um, on Bounties, uh, Bounties Network, and um, a number of questions that you know we ran into um, came in around scalability, and that's kind of how we saw ourselves transition into um, uh, doing some R&D work. Um, uh, within, uh, as a team in building on this. So um, what we originally kind of proposed was um, let's begin building proof of concepts um, around basically an execution engine um, that can mock and mimic um, multiple shards that we're dealing with in uh, Ethereum 2. Um, and this specifically brings to life uh, the phase two efforts and phase two work around that. And so there were a number of questions that we had. How does thinking about you know, asynchronous cross shard transactions, how does thinking about new um, you know, account models, different pieces like that, how will that affect the developer experience um, 
and also e even you know the, the user experience in the long term um, when you're thinking about building contracts and building various uh, applications around um, Ethereum 2.0. And so um, one of what we were originally going to do, um, we were going to build a one-node client. We called it kind of like this test ganache um, and be able to simulate a lot of the moving pieces. Um, we'd be able to you know, mock uh, work around you know, what the interactions with the beacon chain would be um, and interactions within various shards. Um, and part of this was to liven the community around phase two work, um, begin to engage on it, ask a lot of questions. Um, and uh, this is basically the, you know, the first phase um, or the major phase within Ethereum that actually does begin thinking about you know, what, what happens um, on the user side, what happens on the execution layer, what happens on the developer, uh, developer side. Um, and so one of, one of the things we noticed um, is it was a bit too early um, to build like a one-node client. Um, there's still a number of questions and a number of topics and a number of things to engage on. Um, and so that's where uh, basically um, we have begun doing quick and dirty uh, proof of concepts um, around and, and also engaging in some of the specifications around what the bigger picture of phase two will look like end to end. Um, to then begin uh, building upon that and uh, begin building POCs and testing some of these premises, testing some of these outcomes, um, and then from there let that kind of engage more um, on the current evolving research. Um, you know, so I, I just listed a bunch of open research topics. Um, there's more than this, um, uh, but these are uh, things that um, have kind of, you know, uh, a lot of questions that are, are guiding some of the work around phase two. Um, specifically right now. So one of the first things we did just to kind of have fun and do a test environment is we actually built a um, Wasm execution engine, um, mimicking a, kind of a lot of some of the talk around um, specifications right now. Um, and we were kind of able to use that as a basis to think about some of the um, POCs and some of the uh, questions that we are uh, engaging around. Um, I won't go into all these research topics, there's a lot. Um, and I'm, you'll be seeing some blog posts um, from us in the coming week kind of um, describing a lot of the open questions around uh, phase two um, and describing even some of the thought space there right now. So um, specifically, uh, Vitalik put out a new pro proposal. It's on ETH research, um, and it, you know, takes, um, it takes an approach of a lighter, lighter layer one protocol um, and kind of a heavier layer two style abstraction on top of it. Um, and so, uh, you know, part of what we've been doing is thinking of concrete examples, like how do you, how do you fill that in? How does that, how, do, how would that look like almost even from an implementation standard? Um, if you had all these pieces, how do they interact? Does this make it more complex um, than, you know, having a heavier layer one? Um, or does this make it less complex? And so a, a lot of this will um, we'll be releasing um, a blog in the coming week uh, that really talks about this new headspace and um, some of the proposals that uh, Vitalik has put forward and, and made. And it's um, uh, pretty interesting. And, and uh, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of really interesting and cool discussions going on there. Um, so yeah, um, and part of this is just doing uh, quick and dirty POCs on a lot of those different pieces. Um, a lot of this is engaging, uh, um, engaging in the specification work that's happening right now and engaging questions and um, really uh, you know, pushing uh, discussion to understand how everything fits as a whole. So that's, uh, that's what we're working on. Our team specifically, we're called Quilt. Um, and uh, this uh, endeavor um, was kind of a new endeavor um, that started not too long ago. So, cool. I think the next one to present is John Adler. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's John, while Will sets up the presentation. Excellent. I'm here to talk to you a bit about scaling. And also, to take Jing's advice to heart from yesterday, I'm also going to be memeing a bit. So, uh, we all know that Ethereum and Bitcoin have very low transaction throughputs, right? At this point, who would win the global decentralized uh, world computer that's unstoppable or one fluffy boy? It turns out the, the CryptoKitties won that round. 
So we want blockchains to scale, and specifically Ethereum, but we want them to scale and remain secure and decentralized. So we have a few proposed solutions for that. On layer one, we can do sharding, but we can't really do sharding with proof of work because then you're going to be diluting security. So we kind of need proof of stake. Unfortunately, we, there's still a few challenges with proof of stake that we need to iron out. So until then, we're stuck with layer two solutions. Uh, we can use channels, but channels aren't really a scaling solution. They're an interactivity solution. They allow low latency, but they don't allow scaling off transactions that you would usually put on a blockchain. Uh, you can have side chains with validity proofs, but in general, validity proofs should never be used for scaling. They allow for verification, but not auditing. So the only thing that we have left for us, really, by process of elimination is, well, let's use side chains with light client proofs, so fraud proofs and data avail availability proofs. So first of all, before going into you know, how do we solve this, let's first give a few definitions so we know what the problem even is. First of all, what's a sidechain? A sidechain is a blockchain that validates data from one or more other blockchains. For example, the beacon chain is a sidechain that we all know and love. Uh, and sidechains can yank data from another blockchain, a parent chain. For example, the beacon chain can yank deposit receipts from the proof of work chain. But Communication can't happen the other way around. OK, now let's talk about some definitions of the three properties we want, namely scalability, security, and decentralization. So scalability is transaction throughput, not transaction latency. If you want low latency transactions, just use channels. That's already solved. And security is the cost of manipulating history. Here we're not talking about things like smart contract security and stuff like that. We're purely talking about security of the blockchain. It's the cost of manipulating history. And what does decentralized mean? A lot of people have kind of been abusing this word and shoving in a bunch of extra properties that don't really capture what we really want. So in this case, we'll call decentralized the parameter that we really want to maximize. And it, is, uh, it constitutes of three properties, distributed, permissionless, and trustless. And the one that we want to focus on is trustless, uh, where we define trustless as being uh, all state elements are live. In other words, they can be, oh, what am I doing? All state elements are live. Uh, in other words, they can be consumed by their owner in finite time, and they're safe. So they can never be consumed by their non-owners. And in plain English, liveness means your coins can't be locked up permanently, and they can't be destroyed. Safety means uh, your coins can't be stolen. Right, I hope you see that if you have some black box system and I tell you this system can't lock up your coins forever, it can't destroy them, and it can't steal your coins, but you can you know, deposit and withdraw your coins to it to do stuff, well then I hope you see you don't have to trust this black box, right? If it, if it can't do those things to your coins. Right. So the reason there's a star for trustless in the previous slide is that you can't design a system that's completely 100% trustless. There are always certain assumptions, even with layer one blockchains. For instance, for layer one blockchains, coins are live under an honest majority of block producer assumption. Because 51% of the miners can permanently censor the change by mining empty blocks forever. They can do this, and essentially locking your coins. Uh, but layer one blockchains are always safe because digital signatures can't be forged. This is a very powerful property. Uh, layer two systems that rely on light client proofs uh, in the optimal case, it's possible to design worse systems. But in the optimal case, uh, your coins are live under an honest majority of block producers on the parent chain. And they're also safe under an honest majority of block producers on the parent chain. Uh, because the miners can censor a transaction that includes a fraud proof on the parent chain, and therefore steal funds. So do fraud proofs exist? Do these light client proofs exist? Yes, they do. Here's a paper that came out last year by Mustafa al-Bassam. Alberto Sonino and Vitalik Buterin that describes a scheme for light client proofs that include fraud and data availability, availability proofs. And these same proofs will be used for ETH2. So it's not like these are exclusive to what I'm presenting here. So we now have several properties, uh, distributed, scalable, secure, trustless, permissionless, and incentive compatible. And if we can devise a solution with these six properties, we can simply snap our fingers and the scalability problem would cease to exist. Can we do that? We'll see. First is distributed. This one here is just satisfied trivially as we do the rest, so we won't consider it. Scalable. 
How do we increase the transaction throughput? Well, let's just increase the block size. Okay, now secure. This is the hard part. Or the, the rest of the properties are the hard part. So, uh, remember security is manipulating history, right? So we're going to use this thing, this scheme called a commit chain. A commit chain is a side chain that borrows security from its parent chain through periodic commitments. Right, so you hash a side chain block, you include that hash somewhere in the parent chain, and then it can't be, you can't be rewritten unless someone rewrites the parent chain. So you're borrowing security from the parent chain. Uh, I have not yet talked about who gets to write this commitment or how we make sure this commitment is valid. That's the, that's the remaining properties. But at least with commit chains like this, we can borrow security. Right. The next thing we need is trustless, which if you remember, this is your coins can't get locked up and they can't be stolen. So what do we do? Well, it turns out that pl the plasma exit game is in fact a mechanism for a trustless two-way peg. And we can define a child chain, also known as plasma, as a trustless commit chain. The people may also notice that this is kind of the first useful definition of plasma ever. Previously, the plasma researchers have kind of been waiting around in the dark and they didn't know what plasma was. So this is a, kind of the first useful definition of plasma. Uh, Georgios came very close when he called it a non-custodial sidechain, uh, but that doesn't capture you know, the full properties. Specifically, it's not just a sidechain, it's a commit chain. Cool. Now, how do we get permissionless? Remember that uh, the single operator plasma is not permissionless, right? It's permissioned. The operator can just decide to censor any transaction that will, and there's nothing stopping him from doing so. So kind of the pri primary novelty of what I'm presenting today is that it's a variant of plasma, if you want to call it that. It's not exactly, but it's permissionless. So it has that additional nice feature. So we're going to use this technique called merge consensus. Uh, so some of you may be familiar with merged mining. Uh, where you can actually reuse proofs of work. The miners can just mine a side chain and a parent chain at the same time by reusing proofs of work. The problem with this is you're not actually borrowing security. Yes, it's permissionless because you know it's mining, but you're not actually borrowing security because you can't use the parent chain as a checkpointing system. You can't use it as a timestamping server. Uh, otherwise, that messes up the whole thing. You're only reusing proofs of work. We, uh, what we want is a way that's permissionless, but you can also have this commit chain scheme so we know it well, what we can do is actually just use this thing called merge consensus or merge block production, where you just allow the miner to create a block in the sidechain, commit to it on the parent chain, and all sidechain blocks need to be committed to a parent chain block. So they can't just be mined in the void. And then the miner will post a bond for each of these sidechain blocks that he merge produces. And then you can use a variation of a longer chain rule to say, well, if a miner produces a block that is invalid or he with, withholds it, the other miners can just kind of like mine around it on the side chain. So we use the, okay, so we, we, got, we got the permissionless part. Now, one to go, right? We have the sense of compatibility. This is also something that's a little bit iffy for some plasma constructions because you need to use things like watchtowers, which make it non-incentive compatible, or they introduce a bunch of drag. So we noticed that Nakamoto consensus uh, discourages block withholding, it encourages pro progress, and it also fixes the verifier's dilemma because now you have someone who is incentivized to fully ver verify the sidechain, you know, those th the, the miners. So in conclusion, uh, we present a construction here today that is a form of plasma, it's permissionless, it makes no stronger assumptions in the techniques it uses than what is necessary for sharding in ETH2, and it can be deployed today. It does not need to wait for proof of stake. Uh, and the interesting thing is you can actually extend this fairly trivially to allow merge consensus on multiple of these sidechains, potentially 1,024 of them, which allows you a form of heterogeneous sharding in a proof of work context for the first time without security dilution. So if you want to reach me or my co-author on this paper, uh, we wrote a paper on this called Build and Scalable Decentralized Payment Systems. You can reach us here on Twitter or by email. Now on to Suhaib to talk about formal verification. All right. Hey, guys. Uh, my name is uh, Suhaib. I'm going to be talking about uh, formal verification of smart contracts. 
so to motivate why this is important, uh, we all, I think, are familiar with the DAO um, that happened a few years ago. Attacker steals $80 million more or more of F uh, by exploiting your entrance C through what's called a recursive send. Um, Ethereum is hard forked to reverse the effect of the hack and uh, effectively splits the chain into two different currencies. Uh, so uh, interesting example of how security issues can um, have uh, far-reaching ramifications even beyond just what's been stolen. And it doesn't stop there. Uh, there was the par parity wallet hack uh, where attacker steals uh, $30 million worth of ETH uh, just because uh, there was a missing authorization check on initialization function. Um, more security incidents, uh, ran, creating 10 to 57 tokens uh, by exploring integer overflow, uh, causing exchanges to temporarily halt all token deposits withdrawals. Uh, another example uh, related to uh, Augur's token, so the, the vulnerability wasn't in Augur's token, but it was actually a vulnerability in the Serpa compiler, which is the language before uh, Solidity. Uh, and uh, what could have happened if the attack was able to exploit this uh, out of bounds right is that uh, he could have halted uh, the entire Augur economy, which was worth over $200 million. All right, so this is a good example of uh, the fact that we can't even trust compilers. So uh, why is smart contract security so hard? Uh, we all know these uh, code and data are publicly readable, at least for Ethereum right now. Uh, directly control valuable assets, code is immutable. Execution models new and unusual, so programmers aren't, aren't used to thinking about how smart contracts actually execute. Uh, programmers are not trained in mission critical systems, and uh, the languages, development, security tools are still very mature. So the approach we want to take, uh, we're trying to take a consensus, is our formal verification, which enables um, us to automatically generate a mathematical proof that a program is correct for all possible inputs with respect to a formal specification. So the way it works, you take your program, you take a formal spec, you feed it into a program called the verifier, and this verifier generates a formal proof of correctness. So this program is going to be just your source code or bytecode, whatever it is, EVM bytecode or Solidity file. This spec is uh, it's a formal spec that's hopefully much simpler than the code itself, uh, but uh, we're, we're trying to get to that point, but it turns out that the formal specs are quite complex to write these days. And this verifier must formally reason about all program behaviors, right, under all possible environments and under all possible inputs. And it uses mathematical logic or abstract interpretation techniques uh, to do this. And uh, this formal proof of correctness um, is what's called machine checkable in the sense that um, you don't have to actually trust the verifier. Uh, when you look at the proof and compare it to the code, you should be able to see that this proof is actually correct. So uh, if you know, there are companies out there that, that say that you do formal verification, um, and basically the output of uh, the project is either yes or no. Um, so that's not formal verification. So the proper output is actually to give you a proof that you yourself can validate is correct with respect to your program. One of the most difficult parts about building a verifier is uh, that this verifier must understand the semantics of the program, that the, that the, or must understand the language that the program is written in. Uh, so program semantics can be very complex. Um, some program, some languages are actually ambiguous, like C, uh, which introduces all sorts of difficulties in terms of automated reasoning. So uh, there's a recent innovation uh, related to expressing language semantics uh, called executable, executable language semantics. So what does executable or non-executable mean with respect to language semantics? So here is uh, the Ethereum Mill paper, which you're probably all familiar with. Uh, consists of 22 pages of human written specifications uh, in mathematical notation. Uh, this is what's called non-executable, so it's just, it's just a um, uh, just mathematical notation, basically. The alternative is uh, KEVM semantics, which consists of about almost 2,000 lines of specifications written in a new language called K, and this is what's called executable. So what, what do we get from executability of the semantics? So if you, what you can do is you can take the semantics, you can input it into this new system called the K framework. Right? It was developed by uh, Dr. Gregory Rousseau at UIUC and his company called Runtime Verification. And what this framework does is it automatically generates correct by construction uh, programming systems, such as compilers, debuggers, sublock execution, program verifiers, interpreters, runtime monitors, test case generators, bounded model checkers, and more. 
So just from this 2,000 line specification of the operational semantics of a language, you get these tools for free automatically. And not only do you get these tools, but these tools are correct by construction in the sense that they are formally verified. So you get a formally verified compiler automatically. And uh, the other part of this, which is still active area of research, is how do you generate an interpreter that's very efficient? So can we automatically generate an EVM, uh, a formally, formally specified correct by construction EVM? Right, so uh, this system actually works for languages beyond EVM bytecode. It works for Solidity, C, Java, and others. And uh, the big vision here is that uh, this approach to programming systems will enable a pr proliferation of simple domain-specific languages. So now anybody can design uh, the programming language that they want uh, from scratch um, as, and express their semantics in, in K, and they automatically get these tools. So what we're doing at Consensus right now is uh, working on usability and adoption of formal verification. Uh, to start, we're focusing on uh, formally verifying an important contract. This is a simple multi-sig. Uh, multi-sigs are a fundamental component of smart contract applications, routinely used to control $100 million of assets. Um, so these types of contracts are really important to get right. So it's a good target for uh, the effort that formal verification requires. So there are many ch challenges. Uh, to formally verifying contracts. Uh, so for example, we don't want to actually verify the solidity, we want to verify the EVM bytecode that it compiles down to. Um, the EVM bytecode is really hard to, formal about, uh, to reason about formally uh, because it's low level, it's stack based, unstructured, dynamic jumps, no functions, untyped, byte level memory manipulation. So a lot of the high level constructs that you see in solidity just disappear in EVM bytecode. So the challenge that we ha one of the challenges is that we want to verify the bytecode, but um, the, the difficulty is that now it becomes difficult to, to read and write the formal spec. And there are many, many other practical challenges. We don't have time here uh, today to discuss it. Um, so here is an example of the formal specification we wrote for the simple multisig. Uh, this is just uh, a few lines of the total spec, which is more than 200 at this point. Uh, it's written in a language called EDSL, which is um, a spec language for the K-verifier. Right, so R&D's focus uh, right now is the usability and uh, mainstream adoption of uh, formal verification. That's it. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Thanks. So, so uh, to wrap up here, let's do a recap of the three projects and go back here. So the, the first project you heard about was um, from Will. Project Quilt, um, prototype implementations for sharded execution models in Ethereum 2.0. And then John Adler presented um, permissionless plasma with merged consensus. And so Abe talked about formally proving the correctness of smart contracts. Uh, there's a few more projects we have and some more are in, in, um, in process as well. Um, one of them that I just wanted to mention is um, Mustakala because um, it's a very interesting thing. You, you all most likely know about MetaMask, but imagine if that MetaMask, a lot of these MetaMask installs become light clients and they're um, communicating with each other, forming a peer-to-peer -peer network. So this is a project that um, if you know any people who are interested in that, would, would be helpful. So if you're, um, or if you know people who are passionate to contribute to challenges on ETH research or forums such as the Fellowship of Ethereum Magicians, we may be help, able to help you magnify your impact you can email us at hub-rd at consensus.net. Uh, our collaborations are ongoing and expanding. Um, for example, an external collaborator, of course, is the Ethereum Foundation. We collaborate closely with other parts of Consensus, um, really closely with Pegasus. R&D is also performed in other spokes at Consensus. And uh, yeah, thank you to uh, the R&D engineers and the R&D panelists. Uh, th thank you to the head of R&D, Robert Drost. Uh, it's been great uh, working, wor working with him uh, you know, to, to help Ethereum with some of its grand challenges. He was going to uh, give this presentation, but you've just heard my take here. He had an emergency, so he couldn't make it. Thanks to Joe Lubin for his support and identifying ecosystem priorities. And finally, to Thomas Borgers and Ryan Lechner for um, close collaborations in uh, setting up R&D. So we're, we're done, unless uh, anyone have any quick questions, thanks.